Well, I think this is a nice continuation, you know, after we talked this morning about, uh, you know, gradients and valve areas and, uh, and the like with native valves. Uh, well, as you all know, uh, it is a challenge when you have a prosthetic valve and because in prosthetic valves, you have so many kinds uh, that you're dealing with, be it a bioprosthetic valve, be it at times a stentless ones, which, uh, you know, have probably the, among the best uh, velocity profile. Uh, rarely, I think nowadays, we're seeing a ball and cage valve, but, you know, from time to time they'll pop in, but uh, I think within the next five, 10 years, probably you won't see them at all. Uh, most of the ones that we see from mechanical prosthesis, at least uh, in this uh, country, are by leaflet valves. Although from time to time we see, we see uh, still see med halls or single uh, leaflet uh, uh, prosthesis, and obviously we have also the newer generation of percutaneous valves, TAVERS, uh, that uh, indeed, believe it or not, uh, amazingly they have among the best flow profiles of prosthetic valves that have stents on the on the outside. So how how do we evaluate that? Uh, because of that complexity, and there are, believe it or not, more than 25 kind of valves out there with so many different sizes. I think three major principles should hold for you. One, think about valve size, because this is the external ring, sewing ring, that would determine one way or another, a priori, what the valve area to start with for that particular prosthesis. So you would know that if I'm starting with a valve size, of let's say 19 millimeter, uh, you know, the flow profile, velocity across it, valve area, whatever index you're gonna try to, to derive will be much higher, right? Gradient will be higher than if you have a valve size of 30 millimeters. Valve type, uh, that also determines what the velocity profile and therefore what the gradient is. Flow rate, just like even native valves, that will determine what the gradient is across. So if you take a look at these you know, flow profiles here, believe it or not, the two on the right will give you a very nice, decent flow profile, rather flat, meaning the velocities are, are going in almost at the same velocity, as opposed to the one on the left, where you have a bileaflet process that has been very nicely demonstrated, that you have a concentration of a higher velocity between the two leaflets, nicely demonstrated on this color Doppler, superimposition. So you could see where they're gonna be an acceleration of the velocity there. And what does that mean? Well, it means that our normal values compared to hemodynamics in a bileaflet prosthesis to start with, because you really cannot differentiate, you know, these orifices will be higher than normal. The gradients will be higher than what actually is at catheterization. However, we've already incorporated all these normals, quote unquote, right? In our normal values and therefore you would refer to the normal values of a bileaflet prosthesis, be it in the aortic or the mitral position. Uh, I was privileged to, uh, to chair this uh, document. That was actually the first document a few years ago, uh, assessing you know, what normal values are, but importantly, how do you evaluate prosthetic valve function, be it stenosis or regurgitation? And, uh, and I think this still holds, that you're not gonna see a, an update of this for quite some time. What, the, what you will see within the next uh, year, probably two years, is an update, uh, and I know Paul is on, on that uh, document, of percutaneous procedures and see how do you evaluate regurgitation, which is a, a difficult topic to even to start with, with little data. Now for the clinicians in the audience, and even the sonographer, you'd really like to have some clinical information regarding these patients who have prosthetic valves. One, the date of valve replacement. I think that's overall good because uh, you need to know whether there's a, a dysfunction very early on after placement, type and size. And I think this is crucial. I think for the sonographers, the clinician, you need to know that at one point of time. And the beauty, uh, number one, patients carry these cards with them. So you would know what the size of the prosthesis is. And two, nowadays, that electronic reporting of echo reports should carry from one study to another for that particular patient, so you don't have to ask that information all the time, and it would help in your overall evaluation. Certainly, body surface area would be important to normalize few, three of these structures. Symptoms and uh, blood pressure and heart rate, always important, particularly for regurgitant lesions. 
Well, take a look at this. You know, this is a mechanical prosthesis in the aortic position, and this is not infrequent. You see, you know, above two meters per second jet, uh, maybe three usually. And is this normal or is this abnormal? Uh, that always is a question. Uh, refer you back to the data, Ed Chavizade, who now is in Austin. He was a medical student at Baylor when he did the study with, with us. And uh, carried basically, so you have one single valve type, St. Jude Medical, right? You know exactly what the size of these prostheses are from 19 all the way to 31, because obviously we operate on large aortas also at the same time. So you can, you know, most of the time nowadays for aortic prosthesis is 21 or so millimeters of mercury. Remember that size 21 is the sewing ring, which is the outside of that prosthesis. It really doesn't tell you about the inside of the prosthesis or the internal true diameter. But despite knowing these two, just watch how much mean gradient and will be the same plot for peak velocity, same plot for maximal gradient. See how much variability there is. Although I know the valve size and the valve type. So you know that yes, there may be some you know, technical difficulties, but this is not, the, the major thing is I have different flows between different patients and therefore the gradients and velocity will be different. And that's the reason why to have another index conceivably for valve that would at least incorporate flow in addition to what your maximal velocity and gradient. One way to do that is to calculate an effective orifice area of the valve, similar to what you do with aortic stenosis. And if you do that, this is from the same exact cohort that you just saw, that yes, it's much tighter than what you saw before, still some heterogeneity, although I'm accounting for flow. And as you would expect, valve size is, if it is larger, your effective orifice area would be larger for this is for a bileaflet prosthesis. Another index that we lack very much as to the screening, and that's also put in the, in the guideline, is the, what's called Doppler velocity index. It is how much did this velocity accelerate just before the prosthesis to through it. Ideally, if there was no valve, there's nothing, you know, it'll, it'll be exactly the same velocity going through. But you're putting some degree of obstruction. Believe it or not, even in a native valve, you're going to have some acceleration of the velocity, but you're putting a prosthesis there. That velocity will increase. And the ratio, meaning how much did it accelerate, usually normally is less than four times, meaning that this ratio is, you know, should be normally greater than 0 0.25, 0 0.25, which is your dimensionless index that you use. But be careful that this is an index, right? It's one of these indices to help you out. If the diameter of the LVR flow tract is too small or too large, you know, that affects it. But interestingly enough, for prosthesis, in a way, you're helping yourself out by, you put a larger prosthesis in the aortic valve, in the aortic annulus, usually if the annulus is big. So there is a relation of the size of the prosthesis to the size of the annulus, and that's why it works really nicely for you. So again, the same cohort that you just saw before, yes, some spread, but the interesting thing is that it is much less dependent on the size of the valve compared to effective orifice area. And the reason for it, again, is that you put in a larger valve in a larger LV alpha tract. So in a way, it cancels it out, makes it nice, why? because I may not know the size of the valve, but I know at least for this prosthetic valve, a bileaflet valve, my usual Doppler velocity index is about 0.4 or so normally, with plus or minus normally greater than 0.25. And uh, interestingly enough though, that if you see the newer prosthesis, you know, the, the percutaneous valves, the TAVRs, they have a much better flow profile to them Take a look at this case here, and not infrequently, be it irrespective really of the, of the kind of valves, you know, that velocity accelerates by two times only. It's almost like a normal valve itself, meaning that my, v, me, my peak velocity is usually much less than three, and my Doppler velocity index is about 0.5 or above. At times you see a 0.7 or so, but you wanna make sure that your pulse Doppler in the LV outflow tract is not already in the funnel of that prosthesis, because if you're already in the funnel, obviously, or you're too close to the valve, artifactually, this velocity would be higher. So, 
I'll give you two examples here. Normal and obstructed, these are extremes, obviously. Notice that ejection time is much longer, right, for a similar flow. The uh, peak velocity is later, right? Obviously, the velocity itself and the mean gradient are higher. The Doppler velocity index is much lower. And one thing I'd like you to take a look at, at least for prosthetic valves, is what's called the acceleration time from the, to from the time of the click, because all of these will have clicks, opening click to the maximal velocity. And this is your acceleration time. Normally, it should be less than 80 milliseconds or so. If it is larger, you gotta be careful. If it is more than 120, 130, you could almost take it to the bank that you have an obstructed valve. So uh, it is very important to keep those in mind when you, when you look at that. Comparison with a post-operative study is essential because it's almost like the fingerprinting of that particular individual. Now you could decide when you're gonna do that. Most individuals will get a pre-discharge echocardiogram not to evaluate the prosthetic valve itself but usually to look at function, if there is an effusion, other things that goes on. You may want to repeat it two months, three months when he hemodynamic situation is okay, but most people probably won't repeat it. And that's okay because on the higher end, you know, these are the highest valves gradient that you will see most likely they will, they will come down with time. Haven't touched 3D, not at all, not even talked about it. I don't think you need it for usual scanning and having a good baseline study, be it in the aortic or the mitral position. To tell you, nice thing about 3D is obviously for the first time for ultrasound, you see a full display of the valve in a mitral position, I would say close to 100% of the time. You could see where the sutures are, you could see the mechanism, you could see everything else. This is among my best cases on the right side of the aortic valve. Usually you don't see that. I can tell you from my experiences about 30% of the time, 20% of the time that you see nice opening, closing, and you could say for sure that you're really seeing the whole mechanism, which is telling me that if really I'm looking for a mechanism of obstruction or problem, I need something else to help me out. Uh, if I want to look at, you know, simplistically, I could look at fluoroscopy and, you know, decide, obviously, if these are mechanical valves here, uh, decide whether the opening and closing is, is good, but there's a caveat to that because at times the mechanism of obstruction usually is before the valve. So it doesn't, it, it could be a panis formation, and we've had quite a few cases like this, where opening and closing of the valve is still fine, but you have a panis formation that is not interfering with opening and closing of the valve. You could use newer technologies. Obviously, you could use CT here. Take a look at the normal on the left side, opening and closing, and the one on the right side telling you not only the mechanism is not working well, but also you could see in a dark shade of that there is a really a thrombus, you know, on top of that valve itself. So it can give you a little more than a, a, a visit opening, closing, may, maybe tell you about the mechanism. Regurgitation is a bit trickier uh, because you have physiologic, quote unquote, regurgitation. It depends really on each valve. They, they look differently. And we have a challenge with ultrasound regarding flow masking and shadowing, particularly for the mitral position. If you're in the mitral position here, irrespective of how you're looking at it, there is a big zone of shadowing, right? If you're not seeing well with ultrasound, the same thing applies for Doppler. You're not gonna be able to interrogate it or see the jet, as opposed to an aortic position, where irrespective of where you are, you're gonna be able to see that jet and the shadowing is not in that issue. So therefore, you have to be Cognizant, you know, incredibly cognizant and, and uh, for, you know, problems with assessing mitral regurgitation. I'll give you this example here. This is a mechanical prosthesis in the mitral position. And I would challenge you to figure out, you know, is there regurgitation? How bad is it? It would be very difficult, right? Uh, but if you do a transesophageal echocardiogram, obviously there is a major change in this, uh, in this uh, valve itself. And if it loads, hopefully it will load. Uh, yes, it did. And uh, you could see the hissence of the valve itself in a major way, and you know, severe mitral regurgitation there that you couldn't see. You can see at all because of reverberations and shadowing. So there are a few clues for that, and uh, the, the few clues are the peak velocity is much higher, usually. You can forget about pressure half time, and you can look at the double velocity index similar to what you looked at, you know, the aortic prosthesis, uh, and uh, greater than 2.2, this is the reverse one, would tell you something about significance of the regurgitation. 
Aortic, much easier. You use the same thing uh, that we use for native aortic regurgitation. But in a prosthetic valve, you have to be aware, really, of eccentric jets, which are very important and can, you know, uh, you have to use, obviously, other things here, uh, be it volumetric flow, reversal in the, in the uh, ascending aorta, and this is an eccentric jet. You know it's significant, you know, and uh, you have also, by TEE, you can take a look at the mechanism of what's really going on. Is this central? Is this eccentric? Uh, this individual, you have a small abscess in the intervalvular fibrosa. You could see pulsations in that area. So it tells you a lot about it. I think challenges are basically, believe it or not, in the percutaneous procedures nowadays. This is TAVR. I mean, uh, in TAVR, as opposed to a single dehiscence of a surgical uh, prosthesis, you have multiple punctate areas here and there. And, you know, is this a lot of regurgitation? There's a lot of debate of how to. Let me tell you, it's going to be a big challenge for us to, to write some recommendations for you. They can be extremely eccentric, just like you see in this particular case. Uh, you know, so it, it really is difficult. And uh, it's a challenge. I mean, you, you read something in the literature, but to tell you the truth, it is quite challenging and you have to use more than uh, more than a single parameter. And the challenge is, is equally there for uh, a mitral valve clip. Uh, not infrequently, actually, it's, it's like uh, the, the usual to have more than one jet after you insert a clip. And what do you do with these jets and how do you evaluate them? Uh, you look at the pulmonary veins, you try to assess how much is the regurgitation from one or the other orifice. You always be careful about how much stenosis also you're causing. So yes, it is a challenge. We acknowledge that, and we don't have really solid recommendations for you. Just be as integrative as you can ever get. So in summary, clinical evaluation, know the valve type and size, get a baseline echo Doppler after surgery or intervention. Transthoracic certainly is the first line of diagnostic method in cases of high velocity gradient and suspected stenosis or regurgitation. Compare it to previous studies. Hopefully, they're available to you. A TEE, but for a, an aortic position, you may want to think of other things, uh, be it a fluoroscopy or CT. And CMR, in some cases of prosthetic valve regurgitation, where that could be a problem. Not to look at the prosthesis itself, but use some of the quantitative criteria that Dr. Deepanshaw will be talking about. Thank you very much for your attention.